hi there, everyone. Before I start this episode, I want you to know that I'm trying something different this time. I'm going to have the voices change up a lot, uh, since a lot of this is from the perspective of a male, and it will help you discern the difference between his statements and my commentary. I'm crossing my fingers that it doesn't sound really weird and may or may not keep doing this in the future, depending upon if people like it or not. Just flat out, just let me know what you think. Secondly, I apologize this took so long. I happen to be in another state and within a mountain range where the internet was super sketchy, so I didn't get as much time as I wanted to work on the story and had to make up for it when I finally got back home. So with that being said, let's get on with it. I lured two more crack whores up there to my trailer. I killed and butchered their bodies up. I cut the meat up and put it in some Tupperware bowls and then put it in a freezer. I buried the remains in a several shallow graves in a little woods behind the company. Over the next couple of weeks on the weekends, I opened up a little open pit beef stand. I had real roast beef and pork sandwiches and why not? They were very good. The human body tastes very similar to pork. If you mix it together, no one can tell the difference. Welcome to the Beach House 34 True Crime Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Worth. Today, we're going to talk about the case of Joe Matheny. He was a serial killer in Baltimore, Maryland, and he preyed on the homeless and the hopelessly drug addicted. It didn't matter if they were male or female. If it satisfied some need in Joe, he took advantage of them. In some cases, deciding to get rid of the bodies by using pieces of them as filler for his side of the road barbecue stand. While I was researching this case, there were a few times when I ran into commentary by certain individuals who didn't believe all that Joe had to say, but I'll leave that information for you to decide on your own. So let's get into the case of Joe Matheny, nicknamed Tiny and given the name The Cannibal. When Joe was six years old, his dad died in a car crash. His mom ended up having to work multiple jobs just to keep the family afloat. And because of this, Matheny always stated that he had a horrible childhood, that he was neglected and was passed around from relative to relative who didn't even want him. He claimed his father was an alcoholic. He would even often tell people that his mother was dead. This, however, was not true. His mom said that he had a really normal and regular life and that, quote, if he was neglected, it was his own fault. While she did work multiple jobs just to keep the family afloat, neither Joe nor his siblings had ever gone hungry or ever were put into the homes of other family members. His mom even said that Joe was an above-average student, polite, as a child, and very kind. Joe Matheny grew up to be a giant of a man, literally. He was six foot one and weighed around 450 pounds. His stature is what gave him the ironic nickname of Tiny. Matheny even claimed that he served in Vietnam which is what made him turn to drugs and how he eventually developed a drug addiction. However, even though he was in the military, he served in Germany for a short stint in 1973. America's involvement in Vietnam had ended by that time. As he grew older, he rarely contacted his mom and she said he just, quote, kept drifting further and further away. I think the worst thing that ever happened to him was drugs. It's a sad, sad story. It was typical 
for Matheny to spend time in bars and hang out with bands of homeless men in camps inside South Baltimore. Now, one of these places was nicknamed Tent City. He actually did have a steady job as a forklift driver for a company called Joe Stein and Son Pallet Company, which was located on James Street. It was at a dead end road in Southwest Baltimore. This company conveniently is also located on a very secluded lot right next to a wooded area. Now, most of Joe's income that he got from his job was spent on crack, heroin, and liquor. Those that knew and worked with him, though, had nothing but good things to say about him. He was smart, he was nice, he was well-spoken. But in the winter of 1993, a young 28-year-old female by the name of Tony Ingratia disappeared. Now, her struggles with heroin addiction had taken their toll. And even though her dad had taken her in multiple times and she did work to get clean, she couldn't get away from her demons. Her father reported her missing, and it wasn't until three months later that her remains were found on the side of Interstate 95 in Maryland, discarded like a piece of trash. She wasn't even identified until nearly a year later. So while the police investigated, they were unable to identify any suspects, but the question still remained, who did this to her and why? So her case for the time being went cold, but we'll come back to Tony a little later on. Joe would later claim during a confession that at the time he was married and he had a six-year-old son. I, however, could not find any real information to back this up. I bring this up now because according to Joe, this is allegedly what set him off on his crime spree. But as we'll soon learn, he has a way of skewing the truth. Joe said that one night he had to work late. And when he got home, he opened the door to his place and turned on the light. Nothing was there. It was as if someone had come in and just robbed the entire place. He later realized that his wife left him and took their son. He really didn't care that his wife was gone. And according to Joe's own statement, She was a crack addict and a worthless piece of shit. I would have paid her to get out of my life. But she took my son. All she had to do was take him over to my mother's house and she could have had everything else and be gone. I found out six months later that she had moved to the other side of town with some asshole that had her out selling her ass for drugs. They got busted for drugs and they took my son away from them for child neglect and child abuse. I took it upon myself with the hatred I had for these two who lost my son to go looking for them. I had found out from someone that they was going under that bridge and getting high with some homeless motherfuckers who lived under that same bridge. I went there looking for them. They were not there, but the two homeless motherfuckers they got high with, them were down there. They were passed out on some old stinking mattress and that's where they were when I left. Except they were dead from being chopped up that same night. I lured the first crack whore down under that bridge. I got her high and was trying to get information out of her about my old lady's whereabouts. She acted like she didn't know, so I beat the hell out of her and raped her ass and then killed her. I put her in some bushes and went and lured the second bitch down there. I did the same to her as I did the last one, but as I was about to throw her into the bushes with the other one, I noticed an old man down by the river, fishing, looking back up at me. I grabbed a steel pipe that was lying by and ran down on him and laid his head wide open. So I put the two girls and him in the river and weighted them down with rocks. That was a very busy night for me. Five murders within about seven hours. I washed up in that river and cleaned up the crime scene as much as I could 
been left. It was this same summer that the rotting corpses of Randy Piker and Randall Brewer, both residents of Tent City, were found. They had been stacked on top of one another on a dirty mattress, and both had been hacked repeatedly with an axe, just as Joe later confessed. As for committing five murders in seven hours, this too has been questioned mainly because of lack of evidence. For instance, the people he said he murdered and then put in the water, weighing them down with rocks, their bodies were never found. Of course, he claimed that they must have been swept away, which could be true, but Matheny had a way of exaggerating his crimes. Not long after this, Joe Matheny was picked up and arrested for the murders of Randy and Randall. According to sources, Joe was after the $300 that they had in their possession and not, as Matheny claimed, because they happened to know where his estranged wife might be. According to Joe's confession, Two and a half weeks later, I was arrested and charged with the murders of the two men I chopped up. I spent close to 18 months in Baltimore City Jail waiting to go to trial. The trial lasted one week and it was thrown out of court because of lack of evidence. What Joe said was absolutely true. When he did finally make it to trial, the jury came back with a verdict of not guilty. They said that there just wasn't enough evidence to prove that he was the one who committed the crimes. And so he was let go. According to Joe, I was free again. I went back and talked my old boss into giving my job back to me at the pallet company. There was a little trailer on the property, so I told my boss to let me stay there and I could keep an eye on the place. He agreed to this and gave me the keys to the front gate and the main building. The company was on a dead-end road and was very isolated. It was perfect for what I wanted to do. I lured two more crack whores up there to my trailer. I killed and butchered their bodies up. I cut the meat up and put it in some Tupperware bowls and then put it in a freezer. I buried the remains in several shallow graves in a little woods behind the company. One of the women that Joe was referring to was Catherine Magaziner, a 39-year-old sex worker with brown hair and, according to Matheny, a little thin and a little tall. She also had a significant drug addiction. He persuaded her to go to his trailer, where he lived on the property, as he said, of on the grounds of Joe Stein and Son Pallet Company. Now, another of these women that he also killed at this location was 23-year-old Kimberly Spicer. She, too, had been working as a sex worker in South Baltimore. Now, one evening, Joe brought Kimberly to his trailer, where he killed and dismembered her body. He put parts of her body under some wooden pallets at the job site. Kimberly's mom later said, quote, she had her problems, but she was a battler, always struggling with her problems and hoping to turn the corner. Joe then made the most disturbing confession. Over the next couple of weeks on the weekends, I opened up a little open pit beef stand. They had real roast beef and pork sandwiches and why not? They were very good. The human body tastes very similar to pork. If you mix it together, no one can tell the difference. Everything was going pretty good until I ran out of my special meat. So I lured another bitch up to my trailer. I got her in there and started to rip her clothes off and knocking the hell out of her. She was screaming, but there was no one around to hear her except me. And I just kept on laughing at her. I turned around for a split second and that was my mistake, for she ran out the door before I could get to her. There was an eight foot chain link fence with barbed wire on top of it around the front of the company. There was a stack of wooden pallets next to the fence, about 10 feet high. 
that bitch scaled those pallets like a monkey and jumped the fence and ran down to the main road where some guy in a pickup truck picked her up and took her to a nearby gas station where she called the cops. This victim was Rita Kemper. She was also a sex worker in South Baltimore, and Joe had actually just flat out kidnapped her and took her back to his trailer. She stated that Joe had told her that he was going to kill her, quote, just like the others. Well, I knew the cops were on the way, but I didn't run. I gathered up her clothing, grabbed the keys to the gate, and went out and opened it. As soon as I step out the gate, a cop car pulled up, and the cop jumped out and pulled his gun on me and told me to get on the ground. And that's where it all came to an end. This is one part of the story that is highly questionable. To think that Joe just sat there and waited for the police to arrive, I don't buy it for a second. As a matter of fact, one full week after Rita made her escape, Joe ended up calling a friend of his, asking him to help hide Kimberly Spicer's body. The friend then called the police, and this is when Joe was arrested in December of 1996. He was read his Miranda rights and he waved them, indicating he was willing to talk. He confessed to the murder of Catherine Magaziner and drew the investigators a map showing where he had buried the body. He said she was buried in a shallow grave about two feet down and that when he buried her, she was not dressed. They took me down and booked me. She had told them that I said I was going to kill her like the rest, which was true. They had me sitting in a little room down at Homicide, drilling me and damn near kissing my ass, trying to find out what I had done. This too may be a bit of an elaborate story. While he was in custody, he confessed to all of the killings, Catherine Magaziner, Kimberly Spicer, and even Tony and Gracia. He further admitted to the killing of the man and the woman he had weighed down with rocks in the water. He further said that he enjoyed killing and refused to apologize to the victim's families because if he did, it would be a lie. He then said that God knew all about what he did and he was quite happy to be judged by him as well as by an actual judge in a court of law. Joe further said, They had me pulled out of city jail every day for one month, taking me back and forth between the company and the bridge. I had they going crazy over at the company, digging up the remains of those two bitches there, because I had their remains buried in seven different holes. The only thing I feel bad about in any of this is that I didn't get to murder the two motherfuckers I was really after, and that's my ex-old lady and the bastard she got hooked up with. Now this part was true, too, to an extent. On the 17th of December, just a handful of days after his arrest, Matheny gave an audio taped statement where he talked about Catherine Magaziner. In the statement, he further said that after about six months, he went to where Catherine was buried, dug up her body, and removed her skull. He then later threw her skull in the garbage. When the search team went to the location that Matheny had pointed out, they weren't able to find the body. Now, a lot of factors during that time had contributed to the confusion. For example, rain drainage and just the layout of the place. Cadaver dogs did pick up the scent of remains, but the scents were in the wrong locations. A detective then obtained uh, permission and with Matheny in shackles, took him to the location so that he could show them where exactly the body was. Matheny then pointed out a location that was actually not the original location that he had told them. He further said that he had taken her clothing and her purse and buried them someplace else, but no one was able to find these items. After the police had the grounds excavated, they did locate Catherine Magaziner's remains, but her head was missing. Not only that, one of the bones in her right leg 
was also gone. Because of where she was buried, with the terrain and the rain drainage, the forensic anthropologist said that the remains suggest that the body had been there for two to three years. So either Methany was lying, or it was just the weather that caused the incredibly rapid deterioration. No clothing or even remnants of the clothing, like zippers or buttons, nothing was ever found. Joe said, My murder rampage started out as revenge, but ended up as a passion for the taste of blood and the overwhelming sense of power one gets for taking the life of another. Well, that's my story. Horrible, but true. So the next time you're riding down the road and you happen to see an open pit beef stand that you've never seen before, make sure you think about this story before you take a bite of that sandwich. Sometimes you never know who you may be eating. <laughs> when it finally came time for his trial, um, he did at first get the death penalty, a life sentence, and an additional 50 years for kidnapping Rita Kemper. He was indicted on the murder charges in relation to the death of 28-year-old Tony Ingratia, but this charge was eventually dropped just simply due to lack of evidence. Now, in the year 2000, he had his death penalty sentence taken off the table, and instead his sentence was changed to life in prison. Now, this is because under the law of the state at the time, the death penalty was only on the table if he had committed the murder during another act, mainly robbery in this case. Since they couldn't find the clothing and the purse, he said that he had buried, which had belonged to Catherine Magaziner, which would have amounted to a robbery, they had to change his sentence. During this court proceeding, however, Methany got on the stand and talked about how he had strangled and buried Catherine. In court, he admitted to strangling her, but he at first said it was with his hands and then said it was with an extension cord. When he was asked in court how he strangled her, he responded, With my hands. He was then asked, if he used anything else and said i used an extension cord i took the end of the cord strangled her she was passed out and i put a rope around her neck um, an extension cord and killed her then drug her back into the woods and buried her in august of 2017 a guard at the Western Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland, found Joe Matheny unresponsive in his cell. His death was investigated, but they didn't uncover any foul play. He was 62 at the time of his death. While I was researching this, I came across so many inconsistencies in Joe Matheny's statements so much so that I personally don't buy into the fact that he sold sandwiches by the side of the road that included human meat. He may have sold sandwiches, who knows? Or rather, who cares? He had a habit of mixing the truth with fiction, which makes you question everything he had to stay, say in his statements. While he claims his murder spree was based on revenge, I'm more inclined to believe that it was just all drug related. As I stated before, I couldn't find any proof that he had a son or a wife or that any of that story had an ounce of truth to it. I may be wrong, but again, in the overall scheme of things, does it really matter why he did what he did? The fact is he murdered people who were already down and out and had no place else to go. They were just trying to do what they could to survive. Thank you all so very, very much for listening. Please take a moment to follow, like, or comment on the Beach House 34 Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube page. It helps so, so much. I can't wait to share with you all the things coming up. So be sure you subscribe 
so that you're the first to know of all of the upcoming updates. Thanks again, and I will be back really soon with another episode.